Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seat. Now let's welcome Mr. Li Baodong, Secretary General of the Boa Forum for Asia, to moderate the opening plenary. Your Excellency, Zhao Luoji, Chairman of the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress of China, Your Excellencies, State Leaders and Heads of International Organizations, Your Excellencies, Chairman Ban Ki-moon, Vice Chairman Zhou Xiaochuan, and members of the Board of Directors and Council of Advisors of the Boa Forum for Asia, Your Excellencies, Ministers, Diplomatic Envoys, and Representatives of International Organizations, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Friends, Good morning. I am honored to declare the opening of the Boa Forum for Asia Annual Conference 2024. Today we are honored to have with us His Excellency Zhao Luoji, Chairman of the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress of China. His Excellency Kasim Jomart Tokayev, President of the Republic of Kazakhstan. His Excellency David Adian, President of the Republic of Nauru. His Excellency Dinesh Gunawardena, Prime Minister of the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka. His Excellency Roosevelt Skerritt, Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Dominica. His Excellency Hong Sen, Chairman of the Supreme Advisory Council of the King of Cambodia. His Excellency Darren Tang, Director General of WIPO. Mr. Matthias Korman, Secretary General of OECD. Mr. Kao Kim Horn, Secretary General of ASEAN. And Deputy Prime Minister of Russia as well as business leaders from around the world. Thank you for joining us at the event. Seventy years ago, many Asian leaders ingenuously put forward the five principles of peaceful coexistence in indelible contribution to peace and stability in Asia and the world, as well as the sound development of international relations. As we speak now, the human society has already walked out of the shadow of COVID-19, yet the world is becoming more turbulent, crises and conflicts keep flaring up, and global economic recovery still lacks momentum. The Boa Forum for Asia was born in a peaceful and prosperous Asia that features friendly coexistence and aims to carry forward previous leaders' noble ideals and broad visions. It has been working with governments, the business community, and international organizations 
to pursue a bright future and advance the well-being of humanity, practice true multilateralism, and inject stability and positive energy to the world. Now I have the honor to invite His Excellency Chairman Ban Ki-moon to deliver welcoming remarks. Your Excellency, Chairman Zhao Loji, Excellencies, the President, since Secretary General Li Baodong has mentioned all the names, I'll just mention names of two presidents. Excellencies, Kasim Jomart Tokayev, President of Kazakhstan, and also Excellency David Adenang, President of Nauru and Dear Excellencies, Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, and Ministers, and Ladies and Gentlemen. On behalf of the Boer Forum for Asia, I would like to extend a warm welcome to you all for coming a long way to join us at this grand gathering. The annual conference of Boer Forum is a premier platform for leaders to explore the most pressing issues facing Asia, emerging markets, and the world at large. This year, we are honored by such an impressive lineup of policymakers, decision makers, and thought leaders. With your presence and engagement, we can be confident of yet another inspiring and productive brainstorming during these four days. We do have a lot of things. Debate, plan and act. Noya is easy. Noya will be easy in the future. Every year is challenging in its own way. We just had the hottest year on record in 2023 since 1850. A sobering reminder of how acute the climate crisis has grown. Countries are acting to respond and making progress. The COP28 in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, December last year, made a historic consensus to transition away from fossil fuels. Leaders committed to tripling renewable energy capacity and doubling energy efficiency improvements by 2030. That's good news, but not good enough. We need great ambitions and bolder actions to keep pace with climate change and limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Let us do much better at the COP29 this year in Azerbaijan. In the face of the looming climate crisis, Every passing year matters. Seize the day, seize the hour. I had long worked in the United Nations as Secretary General, and always keep in mind the two lofty goals of the United Nations, peace and development. There were good times when we enjoyed a global peace dividend and fast globalization that benefited the majority of countries and peoples. There were bad times when geopolitics and ideology took precedence and split the world into opposing camps and blocks. The lessons we have learned the hard way is that we cannot go back to the bad times in any way. The only way forward is a solidarity, cooperation, multilateralism, globalization, and an open world economy. Unfortunately, not everyone learns the lessons, or 
They just turned the other way. What we are seeing today is a worrying trend in geopolitics and geoeconomies. Conflict in Ukraine is now in its third year and has yet to find a diplomatic or negotiated settlement. Conflict in the Middle East has turned Gaza into a massive humanitarian crisis and disasters. Attacks in the Red Sea put 15% of global trade at risk. Reshuffling of global supply, trade, and investment flows is taking place at the cost of a truly inclusive globalization. But eventually, it's common sense and proven wisdom of mankind that will prevail. I have deep faith in the power of countries working with, not against one each other. My message to you, my fellow delegates, and dear global leaders, is a clear and simple. Global crises have forced us into one same boat. We have no other choice but to roll in the same direction, correct direction. We are faced with common challenges. We must make up, take up our share of responsibilities. With the great power comes great responsibilities. People in this room are global leaders with the power and influence in Asia and the world. As leaders, we are duty bound to stand up, speak out, and lead by action and lead by example. What we say and do here can make a big difference in our shared future. People lay high hopes on us and on you. Do not let people down. And again, thank you, Your Excellencies and distinguished guests, all for joining us this 24th Guam Forum for Asia. I wish a happy stay here in Boao and wish this conference a great success. Ladies and gentlemen, Dear leaders, let us work together to make this world sustainable and peaceful for our future generation. That is, for leaders, your political responsibility. For us and for all of the guests, there's a moral responsibility. Let's finish our job. Thank you very much. Sheshe. Thank you, Chairman Ban Ki-moon. Now I have the honor to invite His Excellency Zhao Luoji, Chairman of the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress of China, to deliver his remarks. Your Excellencies, Heads of State and Government, Your Excellencies, Heads of International Organizations, Your Excellencies, Members of the Board of Directors of the Boao Forum for Asia, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, Friends. Hainan in March is greeting us with gentle breeze, silver beach, and blue ocean. In this beautiful season of spring, it gives me great pleasure to join you, friends old and new, for the Boao Forum for Asia Annual Conference 2024. Let me begin by extending, on behalf of the Chinese government, warm congratulations on the opening of the Annual Conference 
a hearty welcome to all participating guests, and sincere appreciation to you all for your long-standing care and support for China's development. Our world today is going through accelerated transformation unseen in a century. The world economic recovery is lackluster. Problems and conflicts keep emerging. Hegemonic and bullying acts are deeply harmful. Peace and development face grave challenges. Against such a backdrop, do we work in solidarity to tackle the risks and challenges, or do we cling to the zero-sum mentality and push the world toward division and confrontation? The choice we make and the path we choose bear on the future of humanity and the entire world. In this connection, the theme of this year's annual conference, Asia and the World, Common Challenges, Shared Responsibilities, is a highly relevant one. Where should humanity be headed? China's answer to this question of our times is to build a community with a shared future for mankind. President Xi Jinping stated at multiple international occasions that a community with a shared future for mankind means that the future of each and every nation and country is interlocked. So we should stick together through thick and thin and endeavor to build this planet our ours into a harmonious big family. This vision is based on the general consensus and expectations of the international community. It also derives from China's sense of responsibility as a major country. It represents China's contribution to humanity's joint endeavor of protecting the homeland and creating a better future. Over the past decade, building a community with a shared future for mankind has developed from a Chinese initiative to a global endeavor, from a promising vision to substantive actions, and from a conceptual proposition into a scientific system. We advocate an equal and orderly multipolar world and a universally beneficial and inclusive economic globalization. China believes that all countries are equal regardless of their size and calls on all countries to rise above the outdated mentality of block confrontation and zero-sum game, practice true multilateralism and jointly build an open world economy. China has proposed and pursued high-quality Belt and Road cooperation. The Global Development Initiative, GDI, the Global Security Initiative, GSI, and the Global Civilization Initiative, GCI, contributing a lot to global prosperity and stability and delivering concrete benefits to the people. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, 70 years ago, the five principles of peaceful coexistence were proposed in Asia. Today, these principles have gained renewed vigor and are more relevant than ever. Having been through hot and cold wars, hardships and tribulations, people in Asia cherish deeply the value of peace and understand that development gains do not come easily.
It is important that we hold high the banner of a community with a shared future for mankind. Jointly build an Asian community with a shared future, and work together for a peaceful, safe and secure, prosperous, beautiful, amicable, and harmonious Asian home. We should jointly maintain security in Asia, and contribute positive energy to world peace and stability. History and reality both show that. Peace and stability are the common aspirations of Asian people. The biggest consensus of Asian countries, and the prerequisite for Asia's development. In the face of intertwined and complex global security threats, we should implement the GSI, follow the vision of common, comprehensive. Cooperative and sustainable security. Reject the Cold War mentality and block confrontation. Oppose power politics and hegemonic acts, and maintain the regional order that accommodates the needs and interests of all parties. We must always keep in our own hands the future of lasting peace and security in Asia, and pass on the torch of peace from generation to generation. We should jointly promote the development of Asia, and provide enormous opportunities for global economic recovery. Today, Asia is the most dynamic and promising region in the world. Accounting for 40% of global GDP, and contributing to more than 70% of global growth. In the face of a global economy that's been in、uh, doldrums for some time, we should jointly implement the GDI, deepen mutually beneficial cooperation across the board. Seize opportunities in a new round of technological revolution and industrial transformation. Foster and enhance new growth drivers, and promote green, low carbon, and sustainable development to inject strong impetus from Asia into global economic recovery. We should jointly champion cooperation in Asia, and build broad consensus for international solidarity and coordination. Asian countries have the fine tradition of helping each other out in trying times. Together, we have overcome one difficulty after another on our path to development. Now, in the face of clamors for division and confrontation. It is essential that we stay independent, seek strength through unity, continue to walk side by side with each other, jointly oppose unilateralism and self-serving practices, oppose picking sides, and block confrontation, and prevent this region and the world from becoming an arena of geopolitical contests. We should jointly advance openness in Asia, and build synergy for a world of win-win cooperation. A review of the course of human development tells that openness brings progress, while isolation leaves one behind. In today's world, the trend of economic globalization is irreversible. And no country is able to develop itself behind closed doors. It is imperative that we work together for win-win outcomes, jointly implement the regional cooperation economic partnership, pursue high-quality Belt and Road cooperation, and advance negotiations on the new round of China-ASEAN FTA upgrade. In an effort to build. A common regional market.
that is more closely knit and more open. We must oppose trade protectionism and all forms of erecting barriers, decoupling or severing supply chains, but instead share opportunities in opening up and seek win-win outcomes through cooperation. We should jointly carry forward Asian civilizations and provide a constant driver for exchanges and mutual learning of world civilizations. President Xi Jinping has said, to meet our common challenges and create a better future for all, we look to culture and civilization to play their role, which is as important as the role played by economy, science and technology. We need to implement the GCI, respect the diversity of civilizations, promote common values of humanity, and encourage different civilizations to live in harmony and learn from each other and help each other succeed. We should promote mutual understanding and affinity among peoples in Asia and the world and share the benefits of the progress of civilizations. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, here in China, we recently concluded the annual sessions of the National People's Congress and the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, which set the targets, tasks, and policy measures for economic and social development this year, and demonstrated China's confidence in economic rebound and long-term growth. China's GDP grew by 5.2% last year, and is expected to grow by around 5% this year, one of the highest among major economies. China is advancing Chinese modernization on all fronts with high-quality development, which will inject strong impetus into the world economy and provide more opportunities for the development of all countries, especially our neighbors in Asia. China is committed to innovative development. Innovation is a powerful driver of development. China is committed to an innovation-driven development strategy, one that spurs industrial innovation through innovations in science and technology and expertise the development of new quality productive forces. Investment in China's high-tech sector has been growing at double-digit rates for several years, and the number of high-tech enterprises stands at around 400,000. Exports of the new trail, namely new energy vehicles, lithium-ion batteries and photovoltaic products, are growing rapidly. The digital economy has seen rapid growth, and the 5G penetration rate in China tops 50%. China stands ready to intensify cooperation with all countries on scientific and technological innovation, to fully unleash the dynamism of innovation and foster new sources of growth. We will also work with all parties to jointly implement the Global Initiative for AI Governance to promote the sound, secure, and orderly development of AI. China is committed to open development. Openness is the hallmark of contemporary China. China's door to the world will never close, but will only open wider. We will proactively align with high-standard international economic and trade rules and foster a pro-business environment that is market-oriented, law-based, and world-class. We will further shorten the negative list for foreign investment, remove all restrictions on foreign investment access in the manufacturing sector, deliver national treatment for foreign businesses and make it easier for foreign nationals 
to work, study, and travel in China. Hainan is developing itself into a free trade port with Chinese characteristics and global influence, and a new pace setter for high-level institutional opening up in China. We encourage you to make investment and start up businesses in Hainan. China is committed to green development. Green is a salient feature of China's high-quality development. Today, close to half of the world's installed photovoltaic capacity is found in China. Over half of the world's new energy vehicles run on roads in China, and one-fourth of the world's increased area of afforestation comes from China. We are accelerating China's transition to green and low-carbon economic and social development, and are making every effort to peak carbon dioxide emissions before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. We are also working to cultivate large-scale new growth drivers in green infrastructure, green energy, green transportation, and green lifestyle, which is expected to generate investment and consumption markets with a size of 10 trillion RMB yuan every year. China is committed to shared development. Apart from being a main trading partner of more than 140 countries and territories, China is a primary source of investment for more and more countries, and one of the most important investment destinations for most countries in the world. In the next five years, China's trading goods is expected to exceed 32 trillion U.S. dollars, and the potential of its supersized market with over 1.4 billion people will be further unlocked. Investing in China is investing in the future. All countries are sincerely welcome to board the express train of China's development and join hands to work for a global modernization featuring peaceful development, mutually beneficial cooperation, and prosperity for all. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, as an ancient Chinese saying goes, pull the wisdom of everyone and there is nothing you cannot accomplish. Gather the strength of everyone and there is no victory you cannot win. We live in a global village. All countries sail in the same boat and share the same future. In the face of serious and complicated global risks and challenges, we must reinforce confidence and join hands together to build a community with a shared future for mankind and create a better future for Asia and the world at large. To conclude, I wish this year's Boal Forum for Asia a full success. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Zhao Leji, for your remarks. Now may I have the honor to invite His Excellency Kasim Jomart Tokayev, President of Kazakhstan, to give his remarks. Excellencies, I extend my sincere appreciation to the leadership of the People's Republic of China, the Forum's Honorable Chairman, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, and its Secretariat. Since its inception, this platform 
has evolved into a prominent regional and even global center for dialogue and international cooperation. Indeed, we meet today against a backdrop of unprecedented global uncertainty fueled by geopolitical turbulence and economic upheavals. And the outlook is not very promising. As we approach the midpoint of a decade devoted to transformative development, the sober reality is that the global economy is expected to record the slowest half decade of GDP growth in 30 years. Simultaneously, one of the major challenges facing the world economy is the ongoing trade tensions between major economies. Protectionist policies and escalating trade disputes disrupt global supply chains, hamper economic growth, and undermine investors' confidence. It is evident that the global economy requires a new development paradigm. Failure to address this challenge may result in missed opportunities in the coming decade. In this context, Asia is leading the way towards a new era of sustainable development. Asia is expected to contribute 60% of global GDP growth this year. It also accounts for 53% of global goods traded in several of the world's largest and most vibrant, vibrant economies. Foreign direct investment in Asia has grown significantly in recent years. It is also home to some of the world's leading technology hubs, accounting for 70% of global patent filings. The region has substantial human resources. 21 of the 30 largest cities worldwide are in Asia. Of the anticipated $30 trillion in middle class consumption growth by 2030, only $1 trillion is expected to come from today's Western economies. Together, these factors point to a so-called Asian renaissance. Asia's economic achievements are a testament to the region's resilience, innovation, and determination. While challenges lie ahead, Asia is well positioned to continue driving global growth and development in the years to come. In this regard, the BOA Forum has emerged as an embodiment of the Asian innovative approach to achieving universal economic progress. It has also established itself as a prominent symbol of China's commitment towards global development. Ladies and gentlemen, as we navigate these challenging times, the synergy of political will and economic prudence is of crucial importance. To achieve this synergy, multifaceted cooperation is indispensable. It is imperative that we come together to tackle these challenges head on with wisdom, courage, and inclusive interaction. This fundamental logic is the basis of my country's relations with all other countries, especially here in Asia. Today, Kazakhstan-China relations offer a model of effective partnership in which our country has become a primary trade and economic partner for China in Central Asia. Kazakhstan accounts for a half of Chinese trade and investment in the region. Kazakh-Chinese mutual trade turnover reached a historical record of 41 billion US dollars last year. In 2023, the cargo volume between our countries increased by 22%, amounting to almost 30 million tons. The groundbreaking mega project Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, was initially in unveiled during President Xi Jinping's visit to Kazakhstan over a decade ago. This project serves as a key bridge between East and West, and Kazakhstan accounts for 
of all continental traffic between China and Europe. This is a critical advantage that we must fully utilize. Our own investments are strategically aligned with the BRI and, I, and aim to build a modern, multimodal, environmentally friendly and sustainable infrastructure system. It is also important that Belt and Road project is linked to the Eurasian Economic Union and Kazakhstan will be continuously playing an essential role in this process. As a prominent member of the Asian community, Kazakhstan emerged as the largest and one of the fastest growing economies in Central Asia. Kazakhstan accounts for 70% of Central Asia's overall GDP. It registered economic growth of 5.1% last year, almost twice the projected rate of global growth. In the midterm, we aim to sustain at least 6% at least growth and double our economy by 2029. To achieve this, I initiated a new economic course, one that requires structural reforms, but also builds a more dynamic and stronger nation. Kazakhstan's open door policy, vast resources, and free market reforms have attracted many foreign companies, including Chinese. We have also recently created a high powered investment board to bolster implementation of investment projects through prompt decision making and comprehensive end to end state support. In this regard, we invite our Asian partners to invest into our economy and open new avenues for mutually beneficial cooperation. Our focus on modernization and reform with a commitment to the highest international standards, including the OECD, reflects a sincere desire to enhance our global competitiveness. It entails the implementation of comprehensive policy packages aimed at improving fiscal and monetary frameworks, enhancing financial flows, and strengthening institutional quality. Ultimately, these efforts would lead to fostering a market-driven and competitive economy by making, it, by making it more transparent, robust, and vibrant. It is clear that to achieve this and to face contemporary global challenges, at the same time, requires joint efforts. We recognize that no individual country can cope with emerging global, global challenges alone. Therefore, we must work together to address the issues that face us all. First of all, the world needs a new multilateral trading system based on the principles of fairness and openness. Today, trade barriers, protectionism, and treaty withdrawals are gaining momentum, posing significant challenges to the global economy. Addressing these challenges requires elimination of unfair trade barriers, as well as making supply chains more transparent through digitalization. Second, the global financial framework must be reinvigorated. The financial system should provide equality for all nations rather than benefiting only a select few. For developing economies to achieve net zero will require a formidable increase in investment, $2.4 trillion per year. However, the consequent reduction of pollution and climate impacts could save the world up to $4 trillion annually. Hence, we urge the international community to scale up its commitment to sustainable finance initiatives. Moreover, huge Asian bond market has the potential to fuel many development projects. The Eurasian Development Bank plans to issue the first Panda bond as a new financial investment instrument. It can be critical to finance global infrastructural projects. Third, food security remains the most pressing global, global challenge. Nearly one third of the global population still suffers 
malnutrition. Kazakhstan, as a leading producer of wheat in Central Asia, is committed to utilizing its agricultural potential to ensure global food resilience. In general, we must collectively enhance international cooperation by establishing targeted programs, collaborative agro -in innovation hubs, and transfer uh, of innovative technologies. Fourth, the expansion of transit transport cooperation among Asian countries holds significant strategic importance. It is crucial to double up our efforts to develop both existing and new transportation routes. Thus, the Trans-Caspian International Transport Route, or the Middle Corridor, has emerged as the most viable path to secure supply chains between Asia and Europe. Last year, the cargo volume through this route doubled to 3 million tons. In coming years, we expect to reach 10 million tons. At the same time, Kazakhstan is ready to cooperate with its neighbors in developing the North-South Corridor. Our country has invested more than $35 billion in transport infrastructure. Over the next three years, we plan to build over 1,300 kilometers of railways, increasing our transportation capacity towards China, South Asia, and Europe. We welcome the full-fledged involvement of our Asian partners in jointly developing infrastructure projects within these transport crossroads. Fifth, technological cooperation, especially in artificial intelligence, has immense potential to fuel the sustainable growth of the world economy. In this regard, we commend China's Global Artificial Intelligence Governance Initiative. We look forward to fostering strong collaboration among major Asian technology giants to implement joint innovative IT projects. Kazakhstan has worked hard to digitize. More than 90% of governmental services in our country are provided electronically, and the share of non-cash transactions now exceeds 80%. Our country is recognized today by the United Nations as one of the top 30 states in adopting digital technologies and is well equipped to provide a comprehensive IT platform for new projects. The volume of IT exports increased fivefold last year alone. We intend to increase the figure to $1 billion by 2026. Last but not least, it is imperative to cooperate in the field of critical raw materials extraction. Rare earth metals have become an essential component for a wide range of technologies. They are indispensable to achieve net zero in strategic sectors such as industry, digital, space, and defense. We continue to work with international partners on the most effective way to harness our significant deposits of uranium, lithium, titanium, and other rare earth elements. Indeed, there is a strong need for joint geological surveys in Kazakhstan. Asia presents numerous opportunities for collaboration and growth, particularly in sustainable development, digital innovation, and cultural exchange. This impressive ascent of Asia is a true testament to the region's remarkable resilience, boundless ingenuity, and unyielding dynamism. As the region continues to evolve and assert itself, growing influence on the global stage, it is essential for countries in the area to engage and tackle common challenges while taking advantage of opportunities that can benefit all parties involved. By harnessing its economic, technological, and cultural strengths, Asia has the potential to shape the world's future. As the current chair of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and the Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Measures in Asia, SICA, my country sees great and practical prospects 
in the work of such important venues as the BOA Forum. That's why it is my sincere hope that the BOA Forum for Asia and the Astana International Forum, as twin pillars of international dialogue in Eurasia, can reinforce efforts to address common challenges in Asia and beyond. I, ext I extend a sincere invitation to my fellow leaders, innovators, and pioneers to take part in the upcoming Astana International Forum in June of 2024. By embracing a spirit of cooperation and solidarity, we can overcome the challenges that lie ahead and create a brighter future for generations to come. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, President Tokayev. Now, I'm very honored to invite His Excellency President Adian of Nauru. Excellencies and fellow leaders, Secretary General, distinguished dignitaries. At the outset, I would like to express my appreciation to the Secretary General and, of course, the Government of the People's Republic of China for the warm hospitality and wonderful preparations. This will be the first time that Nauru will be participating in this forum, and I am honored to be here to share our perspectives as a Pacific small island developing state. We are grateful for this forum for providing this critical platform to address the pressing challenges that confront Asia, Pacific region, and the world. This year's conference theme, Asia and the World, Common Challenges and Shared Responsibilities, underscores the pressing need for collaboration and unity in addressing complex yet interrelated challenges. In an increasingly interconnected world, no nation can thrive in isolation. Neither should any nation be isolated from economic and financial engagement with the rest of the world. It is only through concerted efforts and mutual respect that we can overcome shared obstacles and build a more prosperous and sustainable future for humankind. As a small remote country, we are heavily reliant on international trade and other international connections. We have seen how fragile our systems are and this was painfully exposed when the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Prioritizing our people and their enrichment is an aspect our nation has followed and we encourage more rather than less regional and international cooperation. So disruptions to the supply chains are minimized. We must build bridges instead of walls and work towards a more integrated and connected world for all our people. We should be inclusive and engaging and look towards maximum economic and financial participation so that no country, large or small, and despite whatever development status, is left behind. Nauru has recently established bilateral relations with China to recognize and support wholeheartedly the One China Principle. This partnership puts Nauru on the right side of its history and benefits both our nations and fosters mutual respect, development, and prosperity. During this historic visit, we agreed to work closely in the fields of Belt and Road, trade, agriculture, media, and economic and financial cooperation. We appreciate and applaud President Xi Jinping's openness and the vision for promoting economic globalization and creating new prospects for growth and development, which is vital for small countries such as Nauru. Our bilateral relationship reflects our commitment and support to engagement rather than disengagement, inclusivity rather than exclusivity, with a shared future for mankind where cooperation and collaboration drive progress and prosperity for all. We believe that peace and development are inseparable pillars of human progress. Peace fosters an environment where individuals can thrive, communities flourish, and nations prosper. Without conflict, societies can allocate resources towards education, healthcare, 
infrastructure and sustainable economic growth, leading to the advancement of all people. As we all know, conflicts and tensions exist in various regions worldwide. In our pursuits of progress and prosperity, we recognize that conflict hinders growth and destabilizes communities. Therefore, we must strive for peace and development without conflict. We should re reaffirm our dedication to building bridges of understanding, fostering empathy and promoting reconciliation. Together, let us work towards a world where every individual can live in dignity, harmony and prosperity, leaving a legacy of peace for future generations to inherit. By prioritizing conflict resolution, we pave the way for prosperity, resilience and shared prosperity for generations to come. We fully support President Xi Jinping's vision of a world without conflict and his dedication to promoting the development of humankind. Nauru stands firmly to the basic human rights of peace, prosperity, and development. Climate change poses an existential threat to Pacific Island nations, despite we ourselves contributing minimally to global carbon emissions, and yet we are among the most vulnerable to its devastating consequences. Facing rising sea levels and more frequent natural disasters, threats to our food security and our way of life. Nauru is taking proactive steps to build our resilience through initiatives such as the Higher Ground Initiative, which involves relocating critical infrastructure as well as communities to higher ground and updating our Nauru Energy Roadmap to achieve our goal of 50% renewable energy, if not more, by 2030. However, we urgently need access to climate finance to support our adaptation efforts. Moreover, we believe that the responsible development of deep seabed minerals, particularly polymetallic nodules, could provide the required metals for the transition towards much cleaner and renewable energy technologies. Unlike metals found on land, countries that have limited resources can develop these new resources and participate and promote the green energy revolution. Nauru is proud to be a leader in this emerging industry. It looks forward to collaborating with China and other partners to develop this resource in a responsible manner through the adoption of robust, world-class exploitation regulations at the International Seabed Authority. We must act decisively to combat the climate crisis and protect our planet for future generations. Nauru places the utmost importance on the well-being of our citizens. We firmly believe that it is only through unity and common purpose and diligence that we can address the challenges facing our region on a global level. Let us harness the power of collaboration and let us build societies that are stronger, more resilient and more prosperous for all. Nauru promotes peace, multilateralism, diversity and inclusivity where we can create a global community that works in harmony towards a shared vision for our future. We deeply believe that promoting cultural exchange, people-to-people -people exchanges and wider inclusive international engagement can foster greater understanding and empathy between our people. On behalf of the government and the, and the people of the Republic of Nauru, I wish everyone a successful outcome from this forum. Thank you. Xie Xie. Thank you, President Adian. Now I, ha I have the honor to invite Prime Minister Dinesh Gunawardena of Sri Lanka to deliver his remarks. Chairman of the Board Conference, Chairman of the Chinese National Congress, Director General, President of Kazakhstan, other heads of states, heads of delegations, Excellencies, former Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, and fellow delegates, 
for us from Sri Lanka, we take this special opportunity to participate in an international event that looks to the future, an international event that accepts the reality of climate change, the wants of renewable energy, and to work together in the, within the Asian borders, but working together with all the nations around the world. Firstly, I would like to thank President Xi Jinping, who has given him tremendous strength in the strong economy that grows and the leadership that has dedicated itself to the economic growth of China. Economic growth of China is economic growth of the world. Economic growth of the world will have to be addressed as we see, as mentioned by the distinguished speakers of a new order. The new order comes on realities of what we can achieve and what we have achieved. Renewable energy, climate change has to be met, and other changes of a blue economy, which are the imp in important areas for the Asian countries. We have to work together in order to achieve these ends, succeed. From Sri Lanka, we have been participating in these programs that have been initiated and supported by our fellow leaders, countries across Asia. I would like to take one example of a success story that we all could carry together and carry to implement in order to reach better standards of living. The experiment, though it has been called a success story of bringing millions of, millions of Chinese people from poverty to better and high living standards. We all face issues of poverty. We all have faced issues of improving our agricultural produce in order to achieve food security. The miracle rice that has been produced in China today can increase production, higher levels of income for the farmers, as well as guarantee a strong future for our food security problems. I raise these two issues because over the years, over the decades, over the centuries, population has faced the challenges of food security, security of better environment and aspirations in order to achieve it. Today, we all know the Boa Conference represents the countries that, are, that produce almost 50% of the new investment that has flowed into renewable energy. Mr. Chairman, it is a promise for the future. It is the great trust that has been laid by the Boa Conference Countries that have joined to take forward the responsibility of sharing the future that can be on trusted basis and targets that we can reach. With this, I would like to thank all the delegates who carry this message from today once again to our areas. Relax trade barriers, open areas for more tourism of different forms of tourism, new requirements on emissions, 
new plans and programs for renewable energy. These can take our planet to a future that is more secure and confidence. With these few words, on behalf of Sri Lanka, I pledge our support to continue to work together as we have committed ourselves to the maritime lanes of the Indian Ocean, to keep it free for all trade to flow from West East Africa to East of Asia. Sri Lanka's port development has taken a new turn of an advanced port development with the assistance of China, for which we appreciate. Sri Lankan Colombo port will become a hub of a new developed port with financial instruments that could cater to the new demands that are growing among ourselves, among our countries, for development and investment, which is essential. This will change the present scenario from East Asia to East Africa and the blue seas that we all could work together for the future that we face in a successful and a agreed joint program is what we look forward to. Thank you once again, and I wish all the nations all success as we move along. Thank you. Thank you, Gunawadana, Your Excellency, for your remarks. Now may I have the honor to invite His Excellency Roosevelt Skerritt, Prime Minister of the Commonwealth of Dominica. Excellency, Chairman of the Standing Committee of the People's National Congress, distinguished heads of state and heads of government, members of parliament, members of the diplomatic corps, special envoys, heads of international organizations, invited guests, members of the media, friends, and I want to specially recognize the former Secretary General of the United Nations and Chairman of the Boa Corporum. Uh, His Excellency Ban Ki-moon. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for the Commonwealth of Dominica to be present at the Boa Forum for Asia 2024, which is an event of great significance for pro projecting political, trade, and economic efforts, and for expanding political dialogue and international cooperation in the search for comprehensive and effective solutions to global problems. In the face of the immense challenges and imbalances that exist around the world today, we need to work together to solve the challenges we face today and build a prosperous future. We need to work together to pull our strengths and move faster towards achieving peace and sustainable development. We need to strengthen cooperation and solidarity between countries in order to provide effective responses to the financial, economic, and social crises faced by many countries around the world. It is clear that sustainable development continues to be a pending issue for the international community. Given the high levels of inequality, poverty, and marginalization among countries. Gross inequalities between developed and developing countries persist and are widening. The unjust international economic order persists 
and is strengthened, and the devastating burden of which continues to be borne by the poorest countries. The effects of climate change threaten the existence of low-lying developing island states and continue to destroy lives. Dear friends, today we have the opportunity to move towards a change of era. We have an option of continuing with the same patterns of production, energy, and consumption that are no longer viable and cause terrible damage to the environment, or assuming a new path that ponders sustainable and inclusive development and with a long-term vision. For these reasons, we share the idea that development will not be sustainable unless it is inclusive of a resilience agenda. The convergence of interests, purposes, and actions among peoples, individuals, states, and the international organizations is essential in order to achieve collective goals. In this regard, we recognize the role of the Boa Forum and the People's Republic of China in providing development alternatives for other countries on the basis of mutual respect and mutually beneficial cooperation. The global initiatives promoted by the People's Republic of China have created the necessary conditions to stimulate economic growth without harming the environment. They have been beneficial in actively assisting developing countries in their process of industrialization and access to digital technologies. Since President Xi Jinping proposed the Belt and Road Initiative 10 years ago, States have expressed their support and appreciation for the, this initiative through bilateral and multilateral mechanisms. The most tangible results of these have been seen in the areas of poverty reduction, food security, health cooperation, financing for development, climate change and green development, digital economy and connectivity in the digital age. China has created a development miracle that has astonished the world. And at the same time, China has made great contributions to the cause of global development. Similarly, the Chinese government, in line with its short, medium, and long-term development goals and strategies, has continued to promote the holding of the Boa Forum to build a platform for cooperation with other countries with a view to achieving a high quality economic development and a shared prosperous future for mankind. Dear friends, like China, the Commonwealth of Dominica, Dominica's development initiatives are people-centered. To this end, we are committed to being the world's first climate resilient nation and have made great efforts to achieve this goal. We have implemented the National Strategy for Resilience Development, Dominica's Climate Resilience and Recovery Plan 2020-2030, and the Disaster Risk Financing Strategy, which together have defined a roadmap for implementing the Sustainable Development Goals. Dominica also welcomes the exchange of experiences and international cooperation in science, technology, and innovation, as well as access to them. We will continue to advocate the maintenance of multilateralism and partnership for solidarity as ways to find global solutions to common challenges. Dear friends, Dominica and China are good friends. Our friendship transcends dollar diplomacy. It is based on mutual respect, trust, non-interference in each other's domestic affairs, and win-win cooperation. Dominica supports the One China Principle and continues to advocate for the peaceful reunification of Taiwan to a motherland, the People's Republic of China. We are convinced, dear friends, that the Boa Forum will continue to be a globally influential platform 
for high-level political and trade dialogue, and it will achieve further successes in the coming decades. I wish this forum a great success, and I wish to thank the government of the People's Republic of China for its most generous hospitality. Xie Xie, thank you very much. Thank you, Prime Minister Skerritt. Next, I'm very honored to give the floor to His Excellency Hongsen, President of the Supreme Privy Council to His Majesty the King of Cambodia. Excellency Li Baomlong, Secretary General of the Boao Forum for Asia, Excellencies, Heads of State and Government, Excellency Zhao Lechi, Chairman of the Standing Committee of the National People Congress of China, Excellency Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. I have the great pleasure of speaking at the opening session of Boao Forum for Asia under the theme Asia and the World, Common Challenges Share Responsibility. With over 20 years of existence, the Boao Forum for Asia has proven to be an influential platform for shaping the regional and global agenda, bringing forward the voice and wisdom of Asia in solving difficult challenges while striving to create a peaceful and better world for all. I would like to begin by congratulating the 75th anniversaries of the founding of the People's Republic of China, as well as the successful conclusion of the two sessions, namely the annual plenary session of the National People's Congress and of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, which have identified key measures to advance China modernization based on Chinese context and characteristics. The emphasis placed on technological and industrial innovation, notably through the development of new productive forces, as well as on environment and sustainability, show that China favors quality rather than absolute growth. For the region and the world, we have a region to rejoice as China continues to pursue open economic and trade policies and express its firm commitment to building of a community of common destiny for mankind by promoting economic globalization and benefit inclusive development for all. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, as we speak, many parts of the world have not been relieved from wars and their devastating effect on innocent civilians as well as economies and trade across the border. The war in Ukraine is entering its third world, and unfortunately, we see no glimmer of peace on the horizon. 
the war between Israel and Hamas is still counting many casualties. I'm heartened by China's active shuttle mediation seeking a ceasefire in Ukraine. We believe that such action will set a good example for all the responsible actors in the international community in accelerating negotiations and achieving peace fire in Ukraine as well as in other parts of the world devastated by war and conflict without delay. When it comes to our region, there are many tipping points where conflict can erupt if Asian leaders do not consult and engage with each other to find ways to address their differences in meaningful and responsible manner. My current concern is that geopolitics continue to dominate the global economic narrative. News about an economic slowdown or sectorial crisis in one country become a reason to declare victory in other parts of the world. Democratic election has become an opportunity to make extreme promises, hostile action, and selfish interests that undermine global interests and the rule-based international order. Furthermore, the current reconfiguration of supply chain does not encourage open, non-discriminatory and fair access to prosperities and technologies transfer, but rather narrow the circle of friends with the determined objective of weakening the other countries. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, for Asia, it is the responsibility of all of us to maintain peace and security in the region to ensure that poverty alleviation does not reverse cause and that future development with shared prosperities can be better fostered. Asia has made great strides in development and serve as an engine of growth, especially during a difficult period when the global economy was at its lowest in three decades. Asia's robust economic growth and position as the world manufacturing and trade epicenter have given it an important global role. Despite the recent global economic slowdown and supply chain reconfiguration, Asia as a whole is still expected to contribute 60% of global real GDP growth in the coming year. In this regard, it is essential for our region to work together to maintain this positive momentum. Our action should be guided by the principle of rule-based multilateralism that work for all of us, not just for any particular group of nations. We should continue to strive for deeper integration and better connectivity rather than decoupling and disruption. We must recognize that the principle of multilateralism have underpinned globalization, sustainable development, and poverty reduction, tangible benefit for the world so far. 
I would like to take this opportunity to commend China for its role as a global leader in shouldering a heavy responsibility in supporting the growth of all the nation from Asia to Africa to Latin America. The Belen Road Initiative I support the construction of public goods in different continents. These basic infrastructures are integral part of the development and poverty reduction efforts for the people in the beneficiary countries, including Cambodia. We must recognize that China's model of growth and development has a low ordination to prosper with it, not at the expense of others. It is our shared responsibility to foster common growth based on a multilateral, rule-based international order and give all countries, large and small, the opportunity to shine, grow, and have their voice heard. We must endeavor to uphold multilateralism that support the interests of the entire communities of nations so that the people of the world can enjoy peace and a better qualities of life. I would like to conclude my speech by wishing the Boao Forum for Asia continued success and fruitful deliberation in the interest of the world. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Chairman Hong Sen. Now I have the honor to invite Mr. Darren Tang, Director General of WIPO, to deliver his remarks. Your Excellency, Mr. Zhao Leji, Chairman of the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress of China. Your Excellency, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, Chairman of the Boa Forum for Asia. Mr. Li Baotong, Secretary General of the Boa Forum for Asia. Excellencies, distinguished guests, it's an honor and pleasure to be here at the Boa Forum for the first time. In 2022, over 20 million intellectual property or IP applications were filed by innovators and creators around the world. That's about 40 applications every minute. This is not entirely surprising. As the Director General of the World Intellectual Property Organization, I'm seeing more and more countries, especially emerging economies and developing countries, turn to innovation, creativity, technology, and digitalization to drive growth and development. But what may be surprising to many of you is that Asia has become the world's most powerful IP engine. With 70% of all IP applications coming from Asia, up from 50% 20 years ago. Why is this happening? First, confidence in domestic innovation and creativity in Asia has increased tremendously. Not only is Asia home to 300 over unicorns and a quarter of the world's technology scale ups, but Asia files more patents in semiconductors, digital technology, and computer technology than the rest of the world combined. Asia culture and content is also booming. Increasingly, people around the world dance to K pop, 
relax with Asian language film and TV, and connect through games like Genshin Impact. Second, Asia has emerged as a centre of vibrant business entrepreneurship. Not only is Asia home to the world's fastest growing middle class, its peoples are also adapting to digital services faster than anywhere else. Asian entrepreneurs drive 70% of all trademark filings in the world, and Asian brands have become household names everywhere, with the region home to 14 of the world's 25 strongest brands. And third, government and popular support for innovation has become stronger. WIPO's Global Innovation Index, or GII, ranks the performance of over 130 economies around the year, each year, around the world each year. Six Asian economies are now in the world's top 20, with China the only middle-income economy near the top 10. The fastest improving countries are also predominantly from Asia. Last year, WIPO surveyed 25,000 laypersons from around the world about their attitudes towards IP. Interestingly, it showed that 75% of people from Asia agree that IP benefits the economy, higher than in any other part of the world. These developments show that Asia has emerged as a major driver of ideas and innovation, and that the global IP landscape has become, has become much more diversified, with game-changing ideas emerging from all parts of the world. WIPO welcomes this development, but it also means that the work of my agency cannot be business as usual. IP can no longer be just for experts and specialists, but also for those innovating and creating on the ground and at the grassroots level. IP cannot be only for the biggest companies, but also for startups, small and medium enterprises, women and youth. And IP must now become a powerful catalyst for all countries to create jobs, attract investments, support businesses, and for economic, social, and cultural development. As a United Nations agency, WIPO is pleased to be a forum where important IP issues are discussed by our 193 members and where global IP standards are set. But discussion must lead to action, and that's why we're focused on using our networks, our expertise and resources to create impact on the ground. And let me share with you a couple of examples. WIPO has a WIPO Academy that has trained in the past 10 years 1.2 million people. And just in the past two years, we trained 220,000 people from all over the world. 45% are from Asia and 80% are from developing countries. And what we're doing is that we're not just training people in technical IP knowledge, but increasingly in practical IP skills so that people in Asia and everywhere else in the world can use IP to grow their business and to meet their aspirations. We have also launched over 80 impact-driven projects around the world. These are not one-day, two-day, one-week seminars or workshops, but months-long programs that focus on mentoring and imparting skills to underserved groups like women, youth, and small and medium, medium enterprises, as well as even local communities and indigenous peoples. In Bangladesh, Jordan, and Pakistan, we're helping women entrepreneurs brand, package, and market their traditional, their traditional products like handicraft and textiles. In Bali, we have launched a project on IP for sustainable tourism. In Oman, we are helping frankincense producers add value and enter new markets. We're doing the same project in Kazakhstan for Apot Apple. And with ASEAN, we are supporting initiatives for the region's creative and digital economy and recently holding a joint youth digital forum in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. But innovation should not just serve a country or region. It has to serve the whole world as well. Let us take climate change, a challenge we all face and which many previous speakers mentioned as well. Addressing the threat of climate change requires that we harness the power of innovation and technology. While green innovations exist, the problem is how to deploy these on the ground to make a difference. Often those who are offering the technologies are not connected to those who need them. And that's why WIPO has created WIPO Green, a free online platform to matchmake those who are offering technologies with those who need the technologies. 
WIPO Green has grown to cover nearly 130,000 technologies from over 140 countries. It is now the largest green tech platform that the UN offers today. And with 1,000 matches, it is starting to make a difference. But much more needs to be done. And here's where we welcome more Asian green innovators to join us to make a difference to the world with your ideas. Ladies and gentlemen, in these difficult and challenging times, my belief is that IP can be a bridge, not just between an idea and the world, but also between different peoples, regions, and countries. WIPO will work hard to support each country to use IP to grow and develop, and to work with all Asian countries as well as with the global family of countries to harness the power of innovation to address our common global challenges. Thank you very much. Sissie. Thank you, Director General Darren Tang. Now may I have the honor to invite Secretary General of the OECD, His Excellency Matthias Corman. Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, uh, friends all, may I join others in thanking the government of the People's Republic of China and the organizers of the Boa Forum for Asia for the very generous hospitality. Uh, thank you also for the opportunity to share a few uh, brief observations in this opening uh, plenary session. Countries across Asia are dynamic, innovative and powerful drivers of global economic development and growth. As has already been noted by one of the previous speakers, Asia will contribute about 60% of global GDP growth this year. Asia's continued growth and development journey will be driven by the powerful combination of your extraordinary pool of human capital, uh, covering half the world's population, your manufacturing capacity and rich natural resource endowment, and your close integration into global supply chains. While <clears throat> leveraging these assets, global cooperation and globally effective, well-coordinated policies to tackle the common challenges of our time will help optimize both the strength and the quality of the growth and development outlook, which will help optimize the opportunities it creates for people across Asia and all around the world. A globalization, a increasing global trade, has been a central pillar of Asia's economic success, delivering significant benefits to its people. Indeed, globalization and increased global trade has delivered increased incomes and living standards across Asia and all around the world, helping to lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Effective global cooperation to ensure a well-functioning global market based on a rules-based global trading system in good working order remains very much in Asia's interest, as it is in the interests of countries all around the world. Let's work together to keep improving globalization so that it can continue to deliver benefits for people around the world in an environmentally sustainable, fair, and inclusive way. And let's work together to tackle climate change, to optimize the global effectiveness of emissions reduction efforts in countries around the world while adapting to the effects of climate change. Let's work together to seize all the exciting opportunities created by the digital transformation of our economies and societies while better managing some of the associated risks, challenges, and disruptions. And let's also work together on effective policy approaches to respond to the economic and social impacts of population aging, 
which is also becoming an increasing economic and social challenge for Asia. In Asia, by 2050, there will be 41 people for every 100 aged 65 and over, up from just 16 today. The OECD is committed to work with governments across Asia to help navigate these and other common challenges, including through our long-standing key partnership with China. We're committed to continue our work together on reinvigorating international trade. Countries around Asia have made significant progress in trade liberalization, including with respect to the services sector. But there is opportunity and a need to do more. We're committed to continue our work together on accelerating the sustainable transformation of our economies and meeting our climate objectives. Working together to achieve our shared objective of carbon neutrality, to achieve our shared global climate objectives, we will need to significantly improve global cooperation and coordination of our efforts. The OECD's inclusive forum on carbon mitigation approaches is our flagship initiative designed to help optimize the global emissions reduction impact of efforts in countries around the world through better data and information sharing, evidence-based mutual learning, and inclusive multilateral dialogue. Last but not least, we are committed to working together and share best practices to ensure our education systems equip our young and our adult learners with the skills they need to succeed in an evolving workforce impacted by the green and digital transformations, as well as population aging. Through our flagship program for international student assessment, PISA, we help policymakers identify progress in their education systems and identify priorities for further reforms with an emphasis on foundational skills for reading, mathematics, and science. Our latest results from PISA 2022 included 81 participating countries from around the world, including 13 uh, in East and Southeast Asia. The OECD looks forward to continuing our work together with you to tackle our common challenges and to assume our shared responsibility, re responsibilities. We will do what we can to help secure strong, resilient, uh, sustainable and inclusive global growth, leveraging our data, evidence-based analysis and inclusive multilateral dialogue to support better policies uh, for better lives. Uh, my very best wishes for a successful BOA Forum 2024. Uh, thank you. Shishin. Thank you, Secretary General Coleman. Next, I'm very honored to give the floor to the CEO of Saudi Arabia Basic Industry Cooperation, Mr. Al Faji. Excellency, Mr. Chao Lo Ji, Chairman of the Standing Committee of the 14th National People's Congress, Your Excellencies, Presidents and State Leaders, Your Excellency, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, Chairman of Bao Forum for Asia, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm truly honored to return to Buau to speak on behalf of the global business community at this prestigious event. For a business, sustainability means having lasting positive impact on society, while manufacturing and selling products that consumers desire. For nearly 50 years, 
that is exactly what SABIC has been doing by uniting all key actors in the common purpose of sustainable development. SABIC makes something truly remarkable happen. It creates synergies for sustainable growth. Through the synergy of cross-sectoral integration, the world economy can be circulized so that material can be reused, preserving their inherent values. Through the synergy of global value chains, the demand of low-carbon consumer products can be met at an affordable value and price. Through the synergy of interdisciplinary innovation, the technological base of progress can be continually renewed. And on top of all this, synergies that arise from the strategic alignment of Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030 and the Chinese Belt and Road Initiatives help broaden the scope and raise the quality of these two great nations' development. For many years, China has been the world's largest for chemical products. It is still remain a powerful economic engine even now, with its GDP growing by 5.2% in 2023. So it is no surprise that SABIC, one of the world's largest chemical companies, has long been creating synergies here. It also established compounding plants, joint venture manufacturing plants, sales and marketing offices, supply chain networks, and world-class technology and innovation centers here in China. After celebrated successful polycarbonate commercial operation at a joint venture with Sinobic last year, the latest edition of SABIC assets will be a 45 billion yuan world scale petrochemical complex that SABIC began constructing last month with the Fujian Energy and Petrochemical Group. I believe that SABIC provides good model for all other companies to follow. If Asian companies cut across institutional boundaries to establish sustainable synergies like SABIC has, then we can have constructively overcome our common challenges and equitably fulfill our shared responsibilities. Finally, I'm very pleased to announce that SABIC will join hands in May this year with the Boa Forum for Asia to host for the first time a PFA conference in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. I look forward to continuing our interregional dialogue there so that we unlock more some synergies for sustainable growth. Thank you very much. Shishi. Thank you, Mr. Alpha G. Now I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Pascal Sorio, Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer of AstraZeneca.
Excellencies, Chairman Zhao, Mr. Ban, distinguished guests, dear friends, Dajia Ho. As the CEO of a company focused on science and health, I spend a lot of time in Asia. Healthcare needs are very large here in the, in the region, and China's innovation in biosciences has exploded in the last five years. AstraZeneca is very committed to China. We employ 18,000 colleagues here, and I have visited China six times in the last 12 months. I enjoy, I enjoy coming here because of the many opportunities to collaborate on our shared commitment. Allow me to highlight three that I believe fit well in the spirit of this year's forum. First of all, science and innovation. Supported by Health China 2030, Chinese biopharmaceutical innovation in the last five years has reached global significance. And I believe it has the potential to help millions of people worldwide. In the last 12 months, my company AstraZeneca has partnered with seven Chinese biotech companies for a total deal consideration of over $6 billion to bring their innovation to the world. This is something that would have been impossible five years ago. This includes an agreement with Ecogen on a new medicine for obesity, as well as the acquisition of a company involved in cell therapy, Graycell Biotechnologies. Cell therapy has the potential to transform the treatment of cancer, as well as some immune diseases, and deliver cure. And Graycell, a Chinese company, will be at the heart of this transformative approach to treating cancer and immune diseases. Just a few days ago, we also signed a memorandum of understanding with Minhai, Minhai Biotech on vaccines for China and for the world. Our large R&D center in Shanghai, which is one of our strategic sites globally, is accelerating the role China plays in developing these new medicines globally and, take, and take a, taking a leadership role in our organization globally. Second, second priority is our shared commitment, equitable health. There are four and a half billion people in Asia, and the average life expectancy has increased substantially to 74 years. And yet, there's a lot more to do. Today, over 85% of deaths in the region are caused by chronic diseases, such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Good health remains elusive to many in rural communities, and patients with rare diseases have also limited access to effective therapies. To make health more equitable for all, we must bring health care closer to patients. Conditions such as kidney disease, chronic bronchitis, much, can be treated much cheaper and much better in primary care centers. Also, investment in early detection is also vital, especially for cancer and rare diseases. Intercepting the disease early gives patients a better chance for cure and avoids or delays hospitalization, which is costly and carbon intensive. Take lung cancer, for instance. There is 1.3 million deaths each year in Asia, more than anywhere in the world. By detecting lung cancer in the early stages, we can increase five-year survival rate to 90%, versus only 10 to 15% if, if patients are diagnosed at the metastatic stage. These kind of advances are within reach, and, and it will soon be possible to diagnose many cancers very early thanks to a very simple blood test, identifying tumor DNA in the blood. And China can also, is playing a big role in these new technologies. Finally, and very close to my heart, sustainability. The climate crisis, we all know it, is, a, is the largest public health crisis of our time. It increases many kinds of diseases and is affecting us already today. COVID killed about 7 million people, but climate change and pollution cause an estimated 12 million deaths every year. At the same time, the uh, healthcare sector accounts for 5% of global emissions and contributes to the problem. We must change that. So with our partners at the Sustainable Markets Initiative, we have set up the China Health Working Group to decarbonize healthcare. This creates exciting partnerships, including a green power purchase agreement for our factories across China. 
Thanks to these partnerships, but also thanks to our own efforts to decarbonize our supply chain, globally we've reduced our emissions by 70%, in China by 80%, even though our company doubled in size in the last few years. And today I'm also very pleased to announce that we are expanding our AZ forest initiative to China, bringing our total commitment to reforestation and carbon capture to $450 million globally. One of the things we need to do as a society is take carbon out of the atmosphere, and nature-based solutions like reforestation are a very good tool to achieve that. In closing, I would like to emphasize the importance of the Boao Forum to strengthen our collective efforts toward the world's greatest challenges. And we at AstraZeneca are humbled to be part of it. Sheshe. Thank you, Mr. Southrop. Now I would like to invite Mr. Andrew Forrest, founder and executive chairman of Australia, for task you. It's great to be here. Your Excellency Chairman Zhao, leaders, fellow Bauer councillors, distinguished friends all. Ni hao, ni hao. <laughs> Thank you for having me today. The Bauer Forum is the epitome of Asia working with itself and reaching out to the world. Look at all of us. We're from countries all over the world, but particularly here in Asia. In Asia, we're from different religions, if at all, different cultures, very different politics. Yet, we are not arguing, we're not threatening each other. We aren't and we mustn't ever, as we should never follow the disharmony we see elsewhere around the world. We vigorously, energetically, and professionally compete with each other and uphold the highest standards of environmental protection and human rights. As President Xi has asked of us all, in the letters I have read and the thoughts I have studied from his youth, we must protect the environment and it is the key to advancing humanity. When we do this, our competition improves the standard of living of all of us, of everyone. This is what the Bauer Forum for Asia stands for. This is despite the considerable differences in religion, politics and culture. This must be Asia's example to the world. Environment is key and the most dangerous is global warming. With an estimated up to 300 gigawatts of green electricity built last year and the 1,000 green gigawatts China already has, it is on track for an amazing achievement over 3,000 gigawatts early next decade, green energy. Add in breakthroughs in the production of green hydrogen, green ammonia, batteries, and Asia can again lead the world into a future without fossil fuels. Here in Asia, we have the leadership, we have the manufacturing capacity, we have the innovation. So the world needs to step away forever from, the, from volatile energy prices, lower standards of living, and in the case of 600 million people, no power at all. Step away from life-ending pollution. We have the AI to forecast the sun and wind and the future energy consumption. Green hydrogen, green ammonia, and batteries with a super smart grid can do the rest. China has shown the world how to build renewable energy assets at scale. It has shown how to drive down the cost of renewable energy and it is must show us how to use them. 
However, there are forces which are pushing against renewable energy, even though Texas has just suffered the worst bushfires in its history. Mexico City is forecast to run out of water in a few months. And Spain has suffered its worst drought on record. How many more warnings? How many more months? How many more years? Hottest on record before we wake up to the fact we must change. China, you will beat your own forecast of peak emissions in 2030. Only working out how to get all of your green energy into your grid when your population needs it is standing between you and a completely green country. Last year, I stood here and almost alone predicted a worst case scenario that we would see our first year as a planet above 1.5 degrees. This scenario happened. Once again, Asia, we can be the example, we can be the proof of what a peaceful, pollution-free world must follow. No longer then will we need fossil fuels. No longer then will our lives and our living standards be at risk. This is a massive economic opportunity worth taking. Asia, let's set the example again. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I now declare the conclusion of the opening ceremony. Let's express our appreciation with a round, a warm round of applause to the wonderful remarks by the delegates and business leaders. Thank you all. Thank you.